All right, guys. So this talk is kind of uh, five talks combined into one. The topic of retention analysis is large, uh, which is what makes it hard. Uh, so for this talk, my emphasis is going to be on the engineering aspect of it, but I'll give you enough background in the business and the statistics part of it to actually understand what's happening. Uh, I think a reasonable outcome of the session would be to for you guys to understand kind of the basics of it, the concepts, uh, and see the big picture of how you'd build it uh, from the ground up. I think understanding every single layer is going to be a challenge simply because we'll have like two days that uh, uh, that will probably require. So uh, let's kind of get going. So w what is retention analysis? Uh, so can, in business, if you have a customer that pays you recurringly, uh, for example, your cell phone or your cable bill, uh, dealing with understanding how your business is doing uh, is actually complicated. Um, to give you an example, uh, somebody like Verizon is, uh, pays about $500 to acquire a new customer. Now, how is it possible? How are they able to make money? Uh, well, you pay them, say, 100 bucks a month, I don't know, let's say 50 bucks of margin, uh, but you stay with them long enough that they're able to afford such expensive customers. Uh, the, uh, so when you have a business, and kind of my business is, li is like that, uh, you start to try to understand, so how's your business doing? Like which customers are more profitable than others? And retention is a key component of it. And that's why uh, kind of start, start looking in the first place. So in the business world, there is, a, you know, this, this topic is certainly like, it's, people are very aware of it and they know it's important. It's kind of simple math. It's what makes or breaks businesses. Uh, and uh, and if you've heard of the big things, like when people were wondering if Groupon is a sustainable business, uh, that's pretty much what they're talking about. Uh, so uh, business people think they actually understand how to, how to deal with this. Uh, as I'll show you, this is really not true. Uh, but to cover how this is typically done in the business world is uh, there are certain assumptions being made. One assumption is that you lose customers exponentially. So basically, if, if you're a customer, uh, you're just as likely to drop in the first month as you are to drop in the 10th month. It just like takes you a while until your luck of the draw gets to you. So it's one key assumption. Uh, the uh, kind of another assumption is uh, that that follows it is uh, so that uh, I mean, there's a simple math to work out the idea. If you have an exponential decay where you lose 3% of the customers. Uh, the average lifetime of the customer is one over 33. Uh, there is like a math sum that you can work out and this is kind of the key formula that you know, business people tend to use. So the way that they go about it is that they okay, say, okay, whatever. My, my, my churn is like 3%. That means I keep a customer for three, three months. I make 10 bucks uh, per month per customer. And that means my customer value is $300 over their lifetime. Uh, one useful thing to realize, and that's actually kind of not necessarily uh, intuitive, is that what seems like a small difference in churn, uh, like three to six percent, is results in a factor of two uh, and difference in the value of customer. And th that's, that's kind of important. So the fanciest tool that business has to analyze a retention is something called cohort analysis. Kind of looks like this, uh, and uh, it is useful. Uh, and I'll explain you what this shows. So the idea is that. So this is actually a screenshot from this tool called Mixpanel. That's a popular tool in this in the space. It says like I'm going to divide all the customers based on the week uh, when they sign up. This is going to be the cohort, and I'm going to look uh, over next weeks and see uh, for how many weeks. Uh, how many, what percentage remains. So the reason, I'm gonna argue that the main reason this uh, report exists is because it's fairly simple to compute. Uh, the case, like the things that makes it simple to compute is that you round twice. You kind of treat everybody who joined in that week as one group. It doesn't matter if they join in the beginning of the group and then at the end of the week you kind of treat them the same. And you do the same thing at the end. 
So like if, you know, if, they, uh, if they quit in the beginning of week 10, it's the same thing. So one obvious outcome of this is that the last uh, cell here is going to be uh, wrong because this is a current week, and that's why the number is probably going to be too low. Uh, but this is like a very useful actual uh, report. So like one way to read it is uh, over time, how does my retention change? Uh, so you know, like, what is it? like seven weeks ago, we used to get 38% retention, and now it's down 31 in, in week one, something went bad. So this is like bad, this is a really bad sign, I need to kind of deal with it. Uh, the problem with this is uh, you, you get this is dead end. Uh, you cannot actually combine these weeks. Uh, because of how a report is computed. So the, these approximations, uh, this, this drives the whole thing. You, you can't get uh, any more out of it. So one obvious thing you say you wanted to do, if you wanted to compare uh, two sources of acquisition, you have like AdWords and Facebook, you want to know which one does better. So you, the way you do it is you do this analysis twice. You kind of put them in front of you and start you know, looking at and try to make some sense of it. Uh, so can we do better? And the answer is we can. Um, so the main thing, uh, like I have not, no basis to uh, substantiate this opinion, and it doesn't stop me from having it. Uh, the, I think the reason that business uh, analytics is done this way today has to do with uh, this is what's possible to do in Excel. And that's what's fairly straightforward to do in Excel, and that's, that's the limit. So fortunately, we have better tools, so let's try to do it differently. So uh, before we start like messing with tools and like looking at SQL, we actually need to understand exactly like what the problem and like what, what we're trying to do. So if you, this we'll see later in the space, this is a fairly typical kind of chart that's used to show, uh, in this case, small set of five customers and, and how they uh, behaved over time. Uh, so this is calendar time. Uh, it's first of the year. Uh, let's say it's a gym. Like gyms tend to get a lot of new customers in the beginning of the year. So uh, the convention I'm using here is that these red dots means uh, the customer churned, he quit. Uh, when the line starts, this is where the customer joined. So like on January 1st, we had one customer join. On January 2nd, we had two customers join, of which one quit. And one lasted till today. So for the purpose of this analysis, we're assuming that this is January 9th, and we have nine days worth of data. Kind of fairly key point to realize uh, is this guy, you know, we have like eight days worth of data for him, uh, or seven days worth of data for him. But uh, he has not quit. Like, so we, we don't know he's going to quit at this point. He's going to quit a year from now. We just don't know. All we, all we know is the data we have. So kind of the first transformation we want to make on this is to uh, left align the data. So for the purpose of retention analysis, you usually care, you don't care about calendar time, you care about customer time. Uh, so from the day that they've joined, how it's happening. So you know, the x-axis now is days as customer, and all, all we did is just move these things to the left. And same thing, notice that a couple of customers quit, while for the rest of them, we don't have more data, but they have not quit. All right, so what we want is to get this. And what is this? This is a combined retention curve that shows all the empirical data we have and, sh and, and, and shows you it is one uh, function. Uh, so, you know, five customers is not that exciting, uh, but let's say we have hundreds of thousands of customers. So this uh, function will show you What's the probability that a customer will remain a customer uh, X days from the point of start? And what that means is if you have 1,000 customers, what percentage of them uh, are going to be a customer uh, six days or six months from them? All right? So how can we, given this is input data, how can we combine this? So this actually, like, intuitively seems very simple. Uh, but once you start looking at it, it's, it's just weird. So there's something weird about it, and there's, this is this concept of censoring that we'll get to in a second. So uh, let's kind of just go through this. Uh, 
and see what's going on here. So, you know, day zero, we have five customers. Day one, we have five customers. Day two, we have one customer drop. So, you know, one, uh, one out of five, that's 20% drop, so we have 80% remaining, all right? That's, so far, it's quite simple. Um, so the, the weird thing happens here. So day three, we have this last customer. He hasn't dropped, but we don't have any more data for him. So this uh, plus mark on this uh, shows that you know, we had this thing called censored uh, point. And uh, it doesn't change the shape of the curve, but it's something that we need to keep track of, and why you'll see in a second. So day four, we have one more customer that dropped. So like remember in this day, one customer dropped and that was 20% drop. So here, this is no longer 20% because we're no longer, the baseline is no longer five customers. And it's no, uh, it's no longer uh, four customers, it's three customers, all right? So one of which dropped and one got censored out. So this drop is actually gonna be one over three, it's 33%. And uh, the way we get this absolute mark, which happens to be 0.53, is it's 0.8 mul multiplied by uh, 0.666. And so this is, you know, this is the end. There are like two more customers that got censored out, so nothing changed, all right? Uh, so, uh, how would we do this? By the way, like any questions so far? Uh, the retention is going to be, the churn is going to be negative. It's actually going to go up. Yeah. And that does happen. So how would we do this in SQL? Uh, so we uh, select all the customers. And now we do something uh, weird. Uh, so, uh, the, as you saw, there are kind of two kinds of data points. There are sensor data points and uncensored data points, and we need to treat them separately. So I was very excited to just learn that in 9.4, there are these things called filtered aggregates. Uh, however, 9.3, there is no, no such thing, and this is uh, like my implementation of workaround. Uh, so I'm very happy about this new feature that's coming. So what we're doing is that for every segment, we're creating two rows. We're creating rows for the beginning, where day zero is day's customer, and we're creating a row for the end. And we're populating two uh, columns. One is uncensored and one censored. So for the beginning, it actually doesn't matter too much, but like, uh, if we're doing more advanced analysis, like we're gonna put it in censored because uh, it's, uh, that's how it works. Uh, the, uh, for uh, the end, what we're doing here is we're putting minus one into one of two columns, either censored or not censored, depending what kind of event it was, all right? So SQL looks kind of funny, but like the idea is pretty straightforward. Uh, so the next step, all we do is aggregate uh, by days as customer. Uh, we just wanna get sums for censored and uncertain for every day. And uh, this is uh, the next step we compute the relative retention. So the weird thing about this query is that you really cannot get the result in a single path. Uh, remember how I showed you it was like 0.8 multiplied by something. There is actually no single aggregate which can compute it in one path, so you have to do it twice. So this step, where all we're doing is computing the relative retention. And uh, we're doing the exact same thing as you saw me do by hand. Uh, this is just how it, it, it works out. And uh, then as a next last step, we aggregate it all together and do a running uh, product. Uh, so the product is not an aggregator that's built in into Postgres, but just like some, but for multiplication. Uh, so I ran this query and I ran the output. And in fact, this is kind of what you would get out of this query. And it's the exact same thing as we got uh, from uh, as, as we got f by doing it by hand. Um, the kind of important thing to notice is that output is sparse. You only have data points for the days when something changed. 
So what can we do with it? Uh, so that's kind of useful, but like it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a stretch of imagination of uh, why is this useful. So let, let's see if we can do something useful with this. The, uh, so like if you remember, this was one of the CTs that I used. And if you look, there is a segment uh, column. And uh, all, I'm, I'm, all I'm putting here is all, you know, like a constant. So I'm not actually doing any segmentation. But let's, uh, you know, that question that I asked in the beginning. So I'm doing advertising across two platforms. I'm doing advertising on Google and I'm doing it on Facebook. And I want to know, uh, does uh, my source of a customer, does it have an impact on what the retention is? So we can find out. And finding out is very simple. Like all we need to do is to use source segment and do group by on it. So we'll do this group by. That's the only modification that was necessary. The query before was already generalized. It already did partitioning, which is kind of useful here. So here we get uh, like a more interesting result. And we find out that all of our Google AdWords customers have stayed and all of our Facebook customers have churned. <laughs> so this in general has been my experience, by the way, ad advertising on these two platforms. But I'm sure it's very dependent on the business. Uh, so I've, uh, th this analysis, uh, I mean, I kind of did for, we did for um, our own company. We need to figure this out. We kind of uh, try to ask the right question and come up with the right answer. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, I found out, I help, was helping out as like some of the companies that I invested in, and I've learned that whatever we invented already existed, and uh, it was called something uh, called Kaplan-Meier Estimator, and I was extremely impressed that I was able to code something in SQL that was called Kaplan-Meier Estimator. Uh, it was extremely gratifying. Um, and uh, the other thing I learned is that uh, while we somehow managed to not know about this in the business world, there is a whole field of science called survival analysis, which studies this in quite a lot of depth, uh, has been doing this for quite a long time, and there is something we can learn from it. So this presentation is largely what, how we can apply that to uh, what we want to achieve. So I don't know if you believe me, it's, that's been for hundreds of years, but this is an example of this kaplan marker from 17th century, uh, and they did not have windowing functions or filtered aggregators back then, and yet they still managed to do it. Uh, so the uh, areas where this is most common is medicine. Uh, this is by, by far the largest uh, area where this is uh, used because survival is kind of really important for medicine, so they care about it. Uh, the reliability theory, like measuring mean times between failure, is kind of another big part of it. Uh, there are actually parts of business like insurance. So, for example, apparently in uh, 18th or uh, 19th century, when you uh, wanted to insure a cargo for like a trip across the ocean, the rates that you paid were based on the hazards that were kind of proportional to how far this thing went and where it went. So they had this thing figured out pretty well back then. So how would we you reuse all this kind of useful knowledge uh, that somebody else worked so hard to make money? Uh, so the answer uh, actually in part lies in this language called R. So R is a language that statisticians use and they build for themselves. And uh, the main usefulness of it is that pretty much every single statistical algorithm you'd care to implement has already been implemented. And it's been tested, has pretty significant stall base, and the output is uh, probably correct. But more importantly, you don't have to code it. So uh, whatever we just did in SQL, uh, this is the equivalent of that of doing into R. So the big get query I'm going to skip over, just kind of, uh, well, this thing just loads the data from database, and uh, this serve fit function is uh, the function that computes the Kaplan-Meier estimator. So then you only need to do is to plot it and you get this output. Uh, as compared to implementing this in SQL, 
uh, there are actual advantages and disadvantages for doing both, but um, it, you, you actually want, will want to do both. And we'll see why. Uh, but so that was like not, not terribly exciting because we just, I showed you in SQL and it was pretty straightforward. Uh, but like uh, in uh, using R, we can do uh, more complicated things very easily. <coughs> so for example, if you wanted to say, I want to predict the future, which is uh, in practice, uh, like there are, like in business, there are only two useful questions to ask about retention analysis. is dividing customers into good and bad uh, and predicting the future. Like uh, given a customer, how much money will I make on him? Uh, so to run a regression in R over this data, which is really non-trivial because for that same reason that like no, that the algorithms that work on non-sensor data do not work on sensor data and you need to write all this like differently is a single line of code. So using this particular library, which I like, and this says do a regression uh, using this particular distribution and this is red line and like if you, in, you can predict in the future, and, you know, given these what, five data sets, you can make significant predictions. And, what you want to do with that is up to you. So, uh, so that's very good. Uh, we have this interesting language that has these interesting libraries. Uh, how can we use it? So it's just, uh, you can use it interactively, and that's how it's typically used. You have an analyst who has uh, our environment on uh, their uh, computer, and uh, they're, they're able to use it. Um, this is not that useful in the context of organization that has heavy investment into SQL tooling uh, because what you want to do is uh, take the results of this, uh, whatever the algorithm run in R and plug that back into your database. So fortunately there is a solution for it, it's called PLR. R is one of the supported extension languages. Uh, all you need to do is uh, create extension and uh, then we can do something like this. So that code that I just showed you before uh, for uh, R, as you can see, it kind of sits inside uh, this function. And it's basically the code is identical. Uh, and uh, the output is going to have two columns. And there is some just magic on how to do it. Oh, yeah, by the way, the most confusing things about R is that dollar Another. The dot is part of identifier, so kind of dot is like an underscore in a more common syntax. I found it very confusing. Um, so this is one way we can run our code inside the database. Sometimes you don't want uh, a, a UDF. You actually want a piece of code which you can run from as a helper. You can run from inside uh, the UDFs, and there is a way to do it. Uh, there is PLR modules uh, table, and you can just stick your code in it. So this uh, fetch raw data helper that I used, uh, that's, that's how it's stored. That's how it's used. And uh, the output of that, that's, that's how you'd call it. And uh, there is, from your point of view, from the user point of view, there is really no difference between this and uh, having this UDF written in SQL. So that's good. So what we learned so far is like how, how to do this and uh, how to stick it into database. Uh, the, uh, let's try to come up with a whole system that's actually useful uh, for our end goal. Uh, this was for me the first project. Uh, so the first version of this we did in Ruby that called into uh, Postgres pulled in data and did calculations in Ruby. And the second version uh, we did in Postgres uh, and because we wanted to keep it inside the database, uh, we kind of had the whole thing going in it. And uh, that actually was really non-trivial. Um, in part because the culture that I come from sort of doesn't use the uh, stored procedures that much in part because uh, this is not really that common thing to do. And uh, I guess my proof for you for that is that there is large repositories of, uh, of libraries for Perl, for Ruby, and so on, and there is no such thing for Postgres. And that's a strong, strong empirical evidence that this is not an easy thing to do for whatever reason. 
uh, and as you st start looking into it, you'll find that there are actually good reasons for it. So for example, in Postgres, you cannot write uh, a UDF which outputs a different number of rows that it takes. You cannot write a join. So all the things you'd see, you see and explain and analyze, you can't really uh, write your own extensions which uh, correspond to that. Uh, there is, optimizer is not capable of, of looking inside UDFs. So it's not gonna optimize the whole query. So there are actually performance implications for what you stick in there. Uh, and uh, the end result of this is that uh, the solution that we came up with was probably pretty similar to Unix where you have utilities uh, which are pretty featureful, uh, have lots and lots of optional arguments uh, to control their behavior, and uh, you can pipe data between them in kind of a useful sort of way. Uh, what you cannot do, uh, I think, is uh, do stuff where you can have little functions and you can call them and combine them. It just doesn't seem that uh, it's uh, the right thing to do in Postgres. Uh, so, the um, useful thing you'll want to do with these functions is parameterize them. So it's great that you can compute the retention of your, all of your customers. Typically, that's not what you want. You want to look at a particular group. And uh, in fact, that last UDF that I showed you that worked in uh, for retention that already did that. So it takes a filter parameter, it later sticks it into SQL, and the result is going to be filtered. So from the user point of view, it's pretty intuitive. They say retention, they pass in a filter, and uh, it kind of gives them the filtered output. So how, how do you do this? So a very typical uh, UDF in this case, uh, growth function. Um, it will take a seg segment, because you want to control how you do group bias. It will take a filter, and it will take H store full of options. Uh, so and it outputs the things you care about. So date segment and, uh, in this case, number of accounts. And uh, like I found this H store to be like very helpful for passing optional parameters. It's basically a hash. Uh, and uh, the reason I end up using H store not JSON is the literal syntax is more concise. And uh, the H store actually has a lot more functionality. So to be able to pass optional parameters, kind of in a similar way as you can with Ruby or something like that, that's actually all that's necessary. Uh, so there is a user options, which is empty by default. Uh, there is a default state for this, and you merge those together, and now you have a hash of uh, all the options which you can use later. And uh, the, uh, the rest of the functions tends to look kind of similar. Uh, you're building your query text, which is can be pretty elaborate uh, depending on what you're trying to do. You execute it at the end, and this is an example of using an option to print out the query. This tends to be useful for debugging because imagine you construct a big query, now it's slow, now you need to uh, optimize it. Uh, you, have, you need to uh, get this out of the here and like try and explain and analyze that's conveniently. So, uh, okay, so that's kind of good so far. Uh, you have SQL, it's able to produce the results that you want. Uh, the next step is to be able to chart the output because you know, we're visual creatures and that's kind of a convenient way of doing it. Uh, so here it's kind of fortunate there are good tools now uh, which uh, you can just buy and uh, they uh, connect to your database, they issue query and they let you build like a nice dashboard uh, to understand your data. So there are three good options on the market today. Uh, I, th I think these are all good tools. Uh, they're a little different. And I'd say the market is pretty mature. Uh, so uh, you probably end up wanting to look at all of them. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is Periscope. Uh, it's a young company in San Francisco. Uh, the kind of big differentiator, this is what we used right now, by the way. Uh, the big differentiator is the user interface for it is really fast as an analyst like to edit a query, it's like super, super snappy. Uh, and that has been for us a big pain point before because if it takes you, I don't know, if you have like uh, 20 charts and you want to edit them and it takes you a minute to edit them, this becomes like a huge problem. Um, 
So the other thing that they do really, really well is something they call custom dimensions. Is uh, so kind of to give you an idea. Say you build this dashboard, and uh, the end user is likely to be somebody who does not actually want to write SQL, but they still want to be able to uh, interact with it. So this custom dimension is a tool to build interactive things. Um, so the, to give you that, uh, like the example used before, let's say we want to give the user ability to filter by sources. Uh, so you create this dimension uh, and you get distinct sources into it. Uh, and uh, this is how it's gonna be available for you to use in queries. This is kind of the interface that they use. Uh, and they, at the runtime, they're gonna expand this to be the right kind of SQL. And it will work correctly if it has multiple selections to work correctly, it has no selections, so it's kind of work this, this things out. And for a user, it's all it's gonna be is that they, they will have some ability to pull down uh, something from the top, select uh, the things they care about, and they're gonna get a filter query. So a second tool that's pretty similar is uh, called Chart.io. Uh, it's a little bit more mature company. The tool is more polished, uh, has better help. Uh, this is what we used before. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice tool. Uh, and the kind of most enterprise tool in the space is something called Looker. Uh, it's a true enterprise uh, product, kind of meant for large teams. They have kind of an interesting layer on top of SQL that's used for building SQL. Um, we have not actually evaluated them, but it's a promising thing. One thing you have to realize about this, all of these things are expensive. Uh, so uh, the we're talking about minimum of like four figures a year, probably five figures a year, depending on the tool. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but I guess the market for the, there's just not that much market for tools for SQL analysts and they have to charge appropriately. All right, so let's say we have all this code and now uh, we actually want to know if it's uh, running correctly. So how do we do this? So this is probably a big strength of SQL in my opinion. It's very easy to test because there is, uh, like it has a canonical representation. That's uh, SQL in and like the results out. And so a typical test for something like this is gonna look like this. Uh, you insert some data, you run the function, and uh, you store the output. It's like as straightforward as it gets. So uh, the trick to it is how are you gonna run it? Uh, so we've, uh, we've open sourced this gem. You can find it on uh, GitHub. And this is kind of a very magical thing for doing diff-based testing. And uh, it's not terribly important what this thing does, but it basically goes, finds all your SQL files, it runs them, it compares them to the reference log file. Uh, the interesting thing is this. So when this thing runs, uh, it's able to do a lot of work that you'd normally have to do by hand. So for the first time it's gonna run, it's gonna realize that there is no reference file and it's gonna prompt you to store it. Uh, if the file is the same as reference, nothing gonna happen, but if there is a diff, it's gonna show you the diff and gonna ask you what you want to do with it. And this has interactive console where you can accept it. Uh, so when tests change, you can manage that very easily and I highly recommend it. So that's great. Like we now have something that we've built and as a developer probably finish, we feel that our job is done. Uh, but the reality is that there is this whole little part of actually running this in production. And there are separate challenges for doing this as well. Uh, so first of all, all the software needs to be installed. Uh, that's like where the fun starts. Uh, so for R specifically, uh, the version in Debian stable is old. In practice, you'll want to use the new R, which is fortunately available. Kranos, like their version of CPAN, they have a Debian uh, repositories and they have the latest of software, and that works fine. Uh, so that's what I recommend. For uh, 
uh, install on our packages, remember we had those like survival libraries and so on. Like you now actually have a problem. Uh, so these things need to be installed on the system. You basically need shell access to install it. I mean, this is a uh, puppet uh, recipe on how to install them, but the idea is like pretty straightforward. You need to run some command on your database server. Uh, this is a, an issue, right? Because you now have a SQL analyst who like wrote some R and he's not able to run it on production server because he's not capable of installing it. Uh, and now he's gonna go and bug the DBA. And this is actually a problem, so you'll, you'll, you'll need to have some way to deal with it, but, but there's an issue. So for our packages, uh, like uh, they, they also present some challenges. Uh, and so like in addition to the shell access, the versioning is similar to Ruby gems, which is to say it's rolling release and uh, there's no guarantees uh, made of any kind of being able to reproduce your setup. So you know, if you care to deal with that, you'll need to deal with it. Uh, a lot of their packages are actually available as Debian files. If you guys have an organization large enough to care enough about stability, uh, you, uh, you can set up your own Debian repository and have a version <laughs> built that you control tightly. Clearly there is infrastructure for doing that. Uh, so that's all possible, it's all work. Uh, so now like back to good news. Uh, the PLR fortunately is available on PGDG. Uh, I think it would be like hell to have to build it because, because of dependencies and this is actually very nice. And like I found it amazing that it works both with R version two and three, and that's uh, very good. Um, so uh, to kind of review, if you have R code which you want to deploy to a server, you pretty much have three options. You can write uh, a UDF, which you can do from PL SQL. Uh, you can use this special PLR module stable uh, which is also you can do from uh, the SQL interface. Uh, but if you want to do something more serious, install third-party packages or you have your own large software packages that you want to manage in this sort of way, uh, you cannot do it through database. So another fun fact is great. <laughs> like you have now introduced something that is going to make your uh, production server not stable. Uh, so, I mean, basically a major reason that we use Postgres is uh, stability guarantees. R most certainly does not have those guarantees. Uh, it's a great software written by professors of statistics for professors of statistics that commonly includes native code. They like really enjoy including native code, which actually why it has pretty good performance. Uh, it also probably means that uh, it will crash. Uh, it, the other thing it means is uh, it's pretty easy to use a lot of uh, memory in R. Uh, its situation is not like Ruby for those familiar with it. It's not that it has a problem working with large data. It doesn't. Uh, it's, uh, but it's pretty easy to do. It, it, you tend to use work on large data sets. It's all in memory and uh, it's pretty easy to duplicate them. So it's pretty easy to run out of memory. And uh, in theory, that means that you will have all kinds of problems. In practice, we have not seen problems, uh, but it is something to be aware of. It's probably some technology better suited for running on a separate uh, data in, in a separate data warehouse rather than a LTP system. I'd probably be worried about putting it into a LTP production system. Oh yeah, and of course another fun fact is you can do anything from R that you can do from shell. So anybody who has that ability to uh, execute uh, or rather write R code on your uh, database server effectively has access to shell. So that's something that you'll need to work with. Okay, so kind of general tips. Uh, so the data you're gonna be working on is time series data. Uh, not just for attention, like everything having to do with this sort of stuff. It's, it's all going to be time series work. And uh, by far the most important thing is you should be using windowing functions, not self-joints. Self-joints are going to be extremely slow. Uh, windowing functions, you tend to not to 
uh, explode number of rows. Like you have, you know, like we had five customers in the data set that I used, we exploded to 10 rows, but that number is fixed. You're gonna start doing self joints and you have 1,000 customers, you're gonna be working with million rows. Uh, it's uh, not gonna work. The other thing that I have found kind of empirically is that people are uncomfortable working with sparse data sets for some reason. And it's usually people's first in intuition is to explode it and get a data point per day and then start working with us. It's not necessary. The code is uh, obviously ends up less performant and uh, it's also harder to think about it. But uh, it's, it's a common thing that I've seen. Uh, you do sometimes want not sparse but filled in results at the end and you can do that, uh, but just do it at the very end. So the other thing is, was, is very helpful is the date range types. Uh, the, the, there are two reasons to use it. Is one, it's fast. The other one is code is going to be correct. It's very hard to do date range operations by hand and achieve both of those. Um, you tend to want to have some convention for, like if you know about date ranges, they can be open and closed. Uh, the common convention, I think the default in Postgres is the include the beginning, exclude the end, and just kind of if you stick to that consistently, uh, that's probably a good idea. Uh, the empty ranges do not behave in any kind of sane way, so you should avoid them uh, in any kind of, if at all possible, uh, they don't do what you think they will do. So you basically cannot model uh, something that starts on day zero and ends on day zero using day, date ranges because it will, the results are going to be different than what you think. And the other kind of technology I have actually found very helpful is constraints and exclusion constraints specifically. Um, in practice, in theory, uh, the challenge of working uh, on retention is all these fancy algorithms uh, all this new technology that sounds cool. In practice, the challenge is that is the data you have is dirty and uh, you don't fully understand how dirty it is and you run something and the output is not what you expect. So data cleaning in practice is like the, probably the biggest part of this problem uh, and the uh, tools that Postgres provides are a big help. And so another thing that kind of tends to be important for performance is uh, do the data cleaning before running analytics queries. Do not try to combine those together. Somehow it ends up uh, in queries which are horribly slow. So on the upside, the uh, time series lets you use CTEs heavily because there are no joints in practice. There is no overhead or no cost of using CTEs. So CTEs act as optimization barriers, so the Postgres will pretty much do what you tell it to in the order that you tell it to. Uh, with CTEs, that tends to work correctly. And uh, you get something that's easy to read and performs well. Uh, kind of a really useful trick uh, for using with the uh, conditionalized uh, UDFs is to have a large query which has every kind of CTE that you care about uh, and then select the one you want. So if you have a CT in your query that's not referenced, it's not gonna get executed, but will get validated. Uh, so if you change something, you'll get like compiler, uh, and uh, uh, the alternative is having a, a UDF which is able to uh, generate a universe of completely different queries and is impossible to test. Another useful trick uh, is uh, if you have uh, if you have a query and you have a table and for testing purposes you want to use some test data instead of that table, you can use CT with that name. It's going to shadow the table. Uh, tends to be helpful. So when you do this stuff because the UDFs are typed and you get kind of uh, type conflicts, if you get this wrong, uh, you'll want to standardize on types. Uh, so I, I suppose it's kind of a matter of preference, but like our convention is to use text, not work R, and prefer numeric to float. Uh, there are trade-offs to these things, but just stick to, just stick to one, it'd be good. Uh, so specifically for Kaplan-Meier, 
uh, curves, there are a couple of things, and, and there is lots of things that are complicated about them, but there are two things that will bite you pretty quickly. One of them is at the tail, when there are only a few people remaining, uh, a single customer quitting will affect the result significantly, uh, and it's going to be confusing. So uh, you just need to be aware of it, and uh, you can work around it by cutting off the data that you don't think is, is significant. So another thing uh, that's a constant problem is doing these retention estimates on data, yes, the data that's kind of heterogeneous in nature. So to give you an idea, if you have like it's, it's especially a problem when you have a different length of data. So for example, you have a whole bunch of, uh, you have a new source that gives, gives you customers uh, and uh, they are bad customers, so they churn uh, quickly. But then you have all the existing customers that are good customers, so uh, if you combine those together, the chart you're gonna see is that, you know, the customers in the first months or two drop quickly and then level out. This is kind of the wrong interpretation of that. So in, in, in practice, to get useful results, you need to segment customers in fairly homogeneous sets. So uh, the kind of resources that are useful for this is uh, to, kind of to learn R. This is a very useful tutorial. Uh, the second uh, one is kind of helpful, like you know how to program another language. Uh, it's uh, uh, like how's R different. And um, the CRAN project does this things called views, which is like actually extremely helpful. They group all the extensions into kind of sets. So if you care about survival analysis, there is actually a page that's edited by a human that tells you all the modules and how you would, would like, what you would use uh, different things for. So you should check that out. So PLR. So I was kind of scared of PLR uh, when I started to use it because mainly because it kind of has low install base and it's kind of a fairly esoteric technology. Uh, we had a very good experience with it. It's fairly easy to learn because it's small. Like all the functionality it provides, uh, the guide that uh, it, it comes with, I think is about 25 pages and like covers everything that there is. And that's kind of helpful. Um, and uh, Joe Conway, who is a creator of it, uh, he has some talks on YouTube uh, that you should watch and that kind of gives you the motivation for what's what. Uh, and that's what they are. And that is the end. So here's my contact information. If you want to get in touch with me, just send, send me an email. Any questions? Yes. I'm glad you asked. Uh, so uh, yes, I cared a lot. So the first version of the uh, SQL uh, Kaplan-Meier that I wrote was much slower. Uh, it in fact did this thing, one thing that I told you not to do, which is explode days. And that meant for large data sets, it was, had complexity that's proportional to also number of days. So it was slow. And R was much faster. So uh, it's, then I rewrote the SQL uh, thing to work, I guess, better. And now the SQL version is faster than R, which impressed me a lot because the R version is not really written in R. The key parts of it are written in C. Uh, so Postgres windowing functions are actually very fast. Uh, the reality is that there is faster implementation of R's version of it as well. Uh, R tends to be fast in part because uh, the, culture of, the culture of R is very pragmatic in that way. Uh, when they find something that's slow, they're going to rewrite it in C, uh, and that works. Yes?
Uh, I agree. I mean, to me, it sounds like what you have is sensor data. So the fact that the sensor is you know, gone and not communicating is different from the fact that the result is zero or null. It's like it's a, there is a distinction. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that does sounds in that way. It sounds very similar. I agree. So, I mean, it would actually go back up. That's, that's, uh, so I think what I'm trying to say is you actually need to decide when your customer, uh, when your sensor drops, right? What does this mean? And this is, you know, this is like a business question or whatever, the, the end user question. Does this, whatever it is you're dropping, does it mean it actually should go down? Or should it be like this? Should it just uh, be like unknown data? It's kind of similar to null, right? Like it's in, in that sort of way. Uh, and you can, based on that decision, you can write the query, which will do the right thing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, guys, thanks a lot.